testing the microphone. Hey, hey, one, two. Test, test, one, two. Yep, yep, one, two. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. One, two. Yep. Hey, look, you're getting audio. Yay. Da, 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 da. Okay, um, second, test. Testing, testing, testing. Test, test, one, two. Hey, hey, one, two. Let me turn that up a little bit. Hey, hey. Let me just send that out just a little bit more. Done. Okay, uh, Patricia. This is uh, Jacob from JP Lilly, just doing a test with you on the Zoom call. Um, I'm going to send a chat to you, just saying if everything's okay, if you could just send me a response. That way I know if everything's good on your end. Yep. 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 No. Test one, two. Patricia, the closed captioner, this is Jacob from JP Lilly. I sent a chat to you. If you could just uh, reply back to me saying that ev everything's okay on your end because we want to make sure the closed captioning is working this time. So, so I will. Uh, I will assume that everything is good to go. Then on your end, Patricia, everything is good on my end. So I see you're connected. So I'm going to turn this microphone off.
Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're ready to get started. <coughs> we ready to go? Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Charles Patrick. I am the Chancellor and Chief Academic Officer here at Penn State Fayette, the Everly campus. We welcome our guests and a special welcome to Senator Bob Casey and his staff who have been very gracious working with our campus to have this special event to go on. Penn State Fayette is a place where people come and gather from the community. And just one quick plug, on the 28th of August, we'll have our concert on the lawn where we will be hosting Simply Queen. We would love to see you come and join us. And anytime you have something this way, we would love for you to stop by. Now I want to introduce Muriel Nuttall, who is the Executive Director of the Fayette County Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Patrick. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a little bit different to have an audience of cars rather than an audience of people. So I have to say that when you hear something good or something that you like, let's beep those horns and let's all hear that you're out there. So let's test it out, see if it works. Awesome, thank you. Well, good afternoon again, and on behalf of the Fayette Chamber of Commerce and the County of Fayette, I would like to welcome you to this important conversation with Senator Casey. Could we have possibly asked for a more beautiful evening for this event? There is no better place than to be right here, surrounded by the lush covers of colors of summer amidst all of the glory, right here in the heart of the Laurel Highlands. No better place to be. My name is Muriel Nottle. I am indeed the Executive Director of the Fayette Chamber of Commerce and the Redstone Foundation, and I am honored to be here representing our amazing county. As we get started, I do want to uh, make some acknowledgments of some folks who have joined us here tonight. I'd like to recognize Representative Pam Schneider, Commissioner Vince DeCides, Commissioner Scott Dunn, Jack Purcell, Fayette County's Council, A.J. Bonney, Perry Township Supervisor, Brownsville Mayor Ross Swords, Brownsville Council President Tracy Zivkovich, Union Town Treasurer Antoinette Hodge, and Dunbar Mayor Andrew Lowry. Let's welcome them and thank them all for joining us here tonight. As we get started again, Senator Casey and his staff would like to thank Dr. Charles Patrick all of the Penn State crew and the Pennsylvania State Police for helping to make today happen in every way possible. They certainly made it easy and big thanks across the board. Now, before I invite the Senator to the stage to speak, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about clothes. I know what you're all thinking there in your car, she's gonna talk about clothes. And yes, I did say clothes. So if you'll humor me for a couple of minutes, I think I can make you understand. It has certainly been an interesting couple of years, now hasn't it? We all agree, right? I would hazard to say that no one would have or could have ever imagined the tumult we've experienced over the last year and a half. So let me take you all on a little trip with me back to January a year ago. Remember that normal? I'd get up in the morning for work and I would don my dress pants, my dressy blouse, my dress shoes, and I would head off to my office to do all the things that we do in the chamber world. And it was good, I guess. Everyone was in a routine and everyone just kind of did their thing. Now advance with me to last March. I still remember those feelings. Remember those feelings, fear, trepidation, the unknown? So I've been really fortunate to be in my position at the Fayette Chamber for 23 years. And let me tell you, I remember the darkest day. 
That is the day that I sat at my desk and called each and every one of my team members and I cried with them as I told them I had to lay them off. The next day as I got up for work, I kept going in to keep the office open for the business community. I took some time to think in the morning. It was such an odd day. And after some reflection of the previous day, I just grabbed a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and tennis shoes and went to work. Now, looking back, that day marked a truly palpable shift. Let me get this off. You helping me. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, thank you. Over the next couple of months, we worked. Me at the office, my team at home, while we watched our business community suffer drastically. It wasn't long before we all knew for certain that regardless of what we had to do sur to survive as a chamber, the most important thing for us was to get back to the office and find ways, any way we could, to help our business community survive, and that we did. Someone, one on, somebody on the team asked me in preparation for that first day back, what do we wear? And I said, work clothes. You know, the kind of clothes that you wear when you've got to be boots on the ground. The kind of clothes you wear when you know there's hard work to do and you might have to get dirty in the process. Now through that work, I saw some of the most amazing things happening. Not in any way to downplay the virus, but I got to watch our county come together in ways that I could have never, ever anticipated. People were sewing masks and dropping them off at the chamber literally by the hundreds so that our healthcare professionals would be protected until that PPE became more available. Businesses were supporting each other every day by sharing supplies, by partnering in any way they could to help each other survive. And the community was supporting small businesses with their dollars. They put their money where their mouth was every day. Our own PR initiative launched the United Fayette campaign that exemplified the reality of what was happening in, in, the, in the community. And the uniform of the day suddenly included sneakers. We had a lot of work to do, and we needed to be nimble, and we needed to move quickly. So January rolls around with the promise of a vaccine, and with a business community practically closed down, we knew that the way forward, the path forward to get to back to a sense of normal was to vaccinate our community. So talk about a proud day in Fayette. That first meeting of a newly created group for Fayette, that united Fayette, was organizing to provide vaccine. I saw a group join together that would have never had the opportunity to work together before. Our county leadership, emergency management, our hospitals, clinics, churches, the chamber, emergency services providers, veterans organizations, aging organizations, school administrators, and more. Within literally days, we had a mass clinic up and running. Our new uniform became the norm. Volunteers were coming together from all over Fayette to support these clinics, and I am so proud of the fact that through these mass clinics, within a three-month period, we were able to vaccinate well over 40,000 people in Fayette. And that is certainly a testimony to what working together can do. Now, that little task force created a mission to help our community reopen and thrive, and it became our model. And from that, as a county, we have refined our mission and vision to become stronger in terms of business, health, and our community. Already this year, we've broken ground on big county projects and cut ribbons for businesses, both large and small. I often say that our county leadership and our organizations right now are laser focused on making Fayette County great. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat things or throw rainbows and sunshine all around without acknowledging the fact that we still have a lot of hard work to do. Our business community is open and operating, which is incredible, but now they're struggling to hire people. We've got work to do to make sure they have the necessary staff to help them thrive. And well, Fayette is not tops in terms of physical health, unfortunately. We rank pretty low. In fact, 66 out of 67 counties in the Commonwealth. In order to become the best place to be, we've got work to do there, too. But we're ready. We have another group called the Fayette Living Well Coalition, and we're just getting ready to host a Blue Zone community assessment. That way, we can find out what we, knew, what we need to do and how to do it. It's all part of becoming great. 
So when I realized I'd be working at a vaccination clinic several days a week, I knew I needed to get some new clothes. These are my work clothes. Black jeans and comfy sneakers, the kind of clothes that you wear when you've got hard work to do. And some of that work happens tonight. Now, let me take a quick break and say that before I do welcome the senator up to the podium, I want to lay out a few ground rules for tonight's 60-minute event. A few housekeeping items, as this is a drive-in town hall that is taking place outside, we are asking our attendees to stay in their vehicles. If you've not already done so, which I think you have because I heard a lot of horns out there, tune your radios to 88.3 FM. In light of Penn State University's policy updates, we're going mask optional for vaccinated staff and attendees. We will not be requiring proof of vaccination. Masks will still be welcomed and, encouraging and encouraged when social distancing isn't possible. The senator and I will have our masks removed because, as you've seen, we stay about six feet apart. Staff and attendees are encouraged to maintain a six feet distance from each other at all times as well, even though we're outdoors. The senator wants to get as many constituent questions as possible today, and to do so, we all need to be on the same page as to how this will work. The senator will begin today's event with some opening remarks on, and his outlook on the political climate in Washington, the work he's doing for the people in attendance and across the state of Pennsylvania, and some of the issues and topics he's paying close attention to right now. Following that, we'll be taking questions from the audience and a few folks who submitted them in advance and are watching at home from live stream. Today is certainly meant to be informative and allow constituents to be heard firsthand by your senator. Please not only respect the senator when he's talking, but the people around you, and please limit shouting, no use of profanity, no unruly behavior. I know Senator Casey will grant you that respect, so please do your best to return the favor. Finally, as you can see in front of the stage, the event is open to the media. By entering this event, as you saw on the signs on entry, that your questions, names, and images have been consented to being used by the news outlets here. If this isn't your wish, now would be the time to make your way out of the event space. So here we are tonight. And as I look down at my clothes, what I dressed for today, let me come out here, I am admittedly a little horrified at the thought that I've chosen, particularly chosen, to wear a pair of faded black jeans and a t-shirt. But you know what? I'm actually proud to wear these clothes. I'm proud of this Fayette County Vaccination Task Force t-shirt. I'm proud of the faded jeans, because clothes fade when you're washing them over and over again because you're doing hard work. Here in Fayette, we're doing hard work to become great, and one thing I know for sure is that our leadership is working hard for us every day, too, and that is what will make a difference. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you one of the most hardworking men I know who understands jeans and comfy shoes, a man who has Fayette County in his heart and works every single day to do great things, Pennsylvania's senior United States Senator, Bob Casey. All right. Thanks very much. Let's hear it for Muriel. Muriel, thanks so much. You're very welcome. You know, Muriel told me earlier today, as we were backstage a couple, about an hour ago, that she was going to provide a little story about what happened in those terrible months of COVID-19. And I know we're still living through it, but we're at the other end of it, thankfully. But she, she told me she wanted to tell a story about Fayette County. And I said, well, don't summarize it for me. I want to hear it. And I'm glad I heard that because I'm not at all surprised that this county came together at a time of crisis uh, to move forward into the future together. And I, I was looking at some of the numbers, and I don't, don't want to remind folks about, about a lot of loss and about, about a lot of suffering, but the latest number I saw in terms of the number of people in this county who passed from COVID, over 328, about 328 is the number. But whatever the exact number is, that's a lot of people to lose. In our state, the number right now is right around 27,700. More killed in action, so to speak, in COVID than killed in action in World War II. Um, so we're mindful that so many families have loved and lost a lot. So many communities have suffered, uh, but we're coming through it as Pennsylvanians and as Americans, but I'm not at all surprised that you all came together. I want to thank you for that. 
I wanted to, to thank you as well for being here tonight. I'm particularly mindful of those right in front of me who are under the hot sun. The only thing I can say to you is I'm under the sun and virtually everyone here has more hair than I do, so it's even worse maybe for those of us who need a little more protection. Next time I'll, bring, I'll get a good Fayette County hat that I'll wear. But I wanted to just provide um, three quick commercials, if you don't mind, and then we want to go to the first question. And I do want to commend and salute all of you for being here in this week leading up to that great day of the 4th of July. We can celebrate our freedom in our country. But I also want to thank those who lead this county, the elected officials. I know that Commissioner Vasides, Commissioner Dunn are here, other elected officials at the county and municipal level. We're grateful that you're here uh, to join in this conversation. Three quick commercials, and I, I'll, I'll be as fast as I can. This first document I'm holding up is a summary, a four-page summary, but the, the front cover is the same as the book. This is called Five Freedoms for America's Children. This is a proposal, or I should say an updated proposal that I made in early 2020, and just as we were going around the state talking about it, uh, the virus hit us all. But what I did was, uh, and our staff, of course, did the hard work, as most staffs do for their elected uh, representative or their elected official. We went through and updated this proposal. And it's really, we borrow right from Franklin Roosevelt. He had four freedoms, talking about the freedoms that, that human beings, the human race, should, should be able to benefit from. We're talking about five freedoms for America's children, the freedom to be healthy, the freedom to learn, the freedom to be economically secure, and the freedom from hunger. So many children in this pandemic uh, were hungry and still are. And the freedom to be safe from harm, to protect our children from those who would do them harm. I won't go through some of the policy now. We might in answer to a question. But that's just a new proposal, and we're still working to get a lot of it done. The second thing I'm holding up is just a bill summary. We have a new bill that focuses on home and community-based services. The shorthand for that would be home care. We're trying to get this done even as we build, invest in the building and repair of bridges and waterways and broadband and so many other parts of our infrastructure. We also want to lift up the caregiving infrastructure, the caregiving folks out there who do this work every day. The workers, the seniors who benefit from this home care, and people with disabilities. So the, the uh, the name of the bill, it's Senate Bill 2210, we just introduced it, and it's called Better Care, Better Jobs. So that's the second thing. Last thing I'll say, and then we'll go to the, the question we want to get to you. It's just, this is a summary, you can't see it from there, but this is a summary of the dollars that went to Fayette County from the rescue plan that we passed way back in March. For example, I'm told we're standing in North Union Township. North Union Township will get $1,185,625. If you look at it on a county level, separate and apart from what a municipality or a township uh, or a borough is getting, the, the, the county overall gets a separate allocation of $25,109,000. So they're just the three commercials, and I'll leave these here. Muriel, I don't know if you can put something on it. Thanks so much. So let's go to our first question. Good evening, Senator Casey. Good evening. I'm Gwendolyn Ridgely. And I Is it am Gwendolyn? Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, thank you. And I'm very passionate uh, a voting rights advocate. And I have a question concerning the status of the protection of voting rights of all citizens, particularly brown and black people here in America, which seems to be highly threatened. I would like to know what could be done to, in, to pass the uh, John Lewis Voting mm -hmm. Rights Act, which would nullify many counterproductive measures that have been introduced by a majority of the state legislators here in America that threaten and uh, will nullify the votes of many uh, groups of individuals here in America, both black, both Latino, both Native American, and so many other disenfranchised groups here in America. Gwendolyn, thanks for the question on voting rights and what we can do about it, in particular the John Lewis voting rights legislation. 
there's really um, two pathways to getting both the John Lewis bill done as well as new and still developing voter uh, protection legislation, I'll call it, uh, to, 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 to fight back against some of the voter suppression that's happening across a lot of states. And look, I have very strong feelings about these bills. I think when you're engaged in voter suppression, you're engaged in one of the great offenses to our constitutional republic. We should be all supportive, Democrat, Republican, Independent. We should be supportive of expanding the options to vote, making it easier for more Americans to vote, instead of, as Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia said, it seems that some people, meaning some legislators in some states, some people don't want some people to vote. And the second some people reference there, of course, are black and brown Americans. Now, I don't like saying that because it, it pains me that that's where our country is right now, but that's just, just the truth as, as I see it. So we've got to do something federally to make sure there's a, a federal standard. There are two things I'll mention, and then I'll, I will move on because I don't want to get people too warm in their seats. Number, number one is when you talk about the John Lewis bill, what we're trying to do there is to, to, to take action after a Supreme Court decision from a number of years ago and make the changes that will update the law. They had, under the old rule, the Justice Department in Washington had a pre-clearance process where a state would pass a voting bill and then because they were in a certain state that had, had voter suppression issues, voting rights issues for years, they would have to clear it with the Justice Department. That got knocked out. We want to put that back in, that so-called pre-clearance uh, section of the bill. So that's John Lewis. But I don't think passing the John Lewis bill will be enough. I think we need a second bill to deal with so many of these other voting rights issues. Now, here's the problem. We either have to get 60 votes in the United States Senate, or we have to change the rule for 60 votes down to 51 votes, which I think we should do, by the way, uh, to make sure this can pass with 51 votes. And then if, if no Republican senator joins us, we can still do it with our 50 votes and Kamala Harris as the vice president breaking the tie. But we're not there yet, Gwendolyn. I don't want to mislead you. We have a long way to go to get to a place where we can pass this, but we're working on it every day. And this is a must-pass uh, initiative, both John Lewis as well as the new voting rights bill that's still being developed because there's some good compromises happening right now. But thanks for the question. And Robbie is <laughs> doing what all the public health people say we should do, clean, just wipe into the microphone after everybody's done. We're being super careful, but it's the right thing to do. Good evening. Good evening. How I'm Mary you? Over. Hey, Mary. Gun crimes resulting in death have increased in our area in recent years. What is your advice for our local leaders and community members um, to help them combat this issue? Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. Look, um, gun violence in, in any community, whether it's Fayette County or Lackawanna County where I live, whether it's here in our state or across the country, the, the scale of gun violence is a uniquely American problem. There's no other country in the world that has the problem we have. You don't go more than a few days anymore. It used to take weeks or months at least before you would have a, a, a mass shooting, and meaning four or more people involved, injured or killed. But now it seems in America we have a mass shooting every other day, it seems, or every couple days. And that doesn't even count the, the single incidents that happen in a lot of communities, often big cities, where one person is shot or one person is killed, and it doesn't add up to four to make it a mass shooting. So th this is not happened anywhere in the world. And I'll tell you, I think as a legislator, uh, I have an obligation to do something about it. We should pass common sense gun measures in Washington uh, that, that make it uh, the law that we're going to finally have a real background check system. The background check system across the country really is a joke. It's just not working. We have major loopholes in it. We've got to fix that. I also think we should be very determined to fill other loopholes, and I won't go through the whole list. But there's a whole series of actions that Washington can take. So it's not up to Fayette County or to a particular locality within this county to take on this responsibility yourselves. 
There's no question that you're playing a role in helping us by advocating for common sense measures and by making it an issue locally. But this is an issue that I think has wide agreement or wide consensus between and among all kinds of Americans, gun owners, people who know that they're, they're going to pass a background check uh, if they want to hunt or, or have a weapon for, for protection. They're not the people that these common sense gun measures are going to focus on. We have to make sure that we take action in Washington. And obviously, at the state level or at the local level, or I'm sure you, you'll be able to pass lo a local ordinance or you'll be able to do other things. But too often, Washington has dropped the ball. We need to finally come together and pass common sense measures. I'll try to be as short as I can because I know people are pretty warm. <laughs> Hi. My name's Melissa Scott. I'm a hey, psychiatrist. I work at Chestnut Ridge Counseling in Uniontown. Are we allowed to call you a doctor? You are. Okay. <laughs> it is uh, the main uh, mental health treatment center in Fayette County, so I'm kind of representing the front lines of mental health. Um, my Thanks for your today, work. That's important work. Thank you. Um, what is the status of legislation at the federal level in regard to improving the ability for law enforcement to work in beneficial ways in assisting those with mental health issues and those in crisis, and what are your plans moving forward with this issue? Well, Doctor, thanks for the question, because uh, we were, we're actually going to do a meeting about this today, a roundtable in Pittsburgh, but I, the car I was in, we were headed west this morning out of Scranton and uh, got on the turnpike. No, I'm sorry, I keep saying the turnpike. It was Route 80. <laughs> and we had a, a flat tire, a long story. So what we were going to do at that roundtable is d discuss a number of initiatives uh, that I've worked on, we're trying to get, get legislation passed as part of this broader effort on, uh, on gun violence and even on, on other, uh, other related issues. What we're trying to do is to recognize a problem that leads to encounters and often deadly encounters between law enforcement and people that have a mental health uh, issue or are in the midst of a mental health crisis, for example. And there are a lot we can do to help both sides on this. Because too often, law enforcement are, are called upon to be, to have a level of expertise that, frankly, no amount of, of training could prepare them for every situation. So there is training that I think law enforcement uh, wants to do with, with mental health and, and, and other experts who have expertise in mental health or disability uh, policy, working with uh, folks with disabilities. So we can certainly do more training. And, We've been working on these initiatives with the Fraternal Order of Police, who have been helpful in developing the bill. But another bill we have is really to finally say, when a call comes in to a, a 911 center, not every call is a 911 emergency, or not every call requires a heavy law enforcement presence. Now, sometimes there's no question about it. There might be a weapon involved. The person might be threatening others. You need law enforcement. But a lot of times, I think law enforcement wishes they had some help from folks who could uh, guide them through that, that uh, particular mental health crisis or some other encounter. So what we're going to do is to, tr what we're trying to do is to pass legislation so that if a call comes in to 911 and it is non-fire, non-emergency, and really kind of non-law enforcement or, or non-criminal, we want to make sure that that call gets through tra trained people, gets diverted to 211 and even a newer version for these kinds of crises, 988. So to be able to divert some of those calls. So not every call is the responsibility of law enforcement. Uh, sometimes there's no avoiding it. Sometimes they have to be there. So that's something we could do. And this has broad support in the disability community. Law enforcement's been working with us and, and other advocates. So I think we can get there if we're smart about helping law enforcement do its job and avoid these confrontations that can often be deadly. I'm really jealous of Robbie's hat right now. <laughs> I'll get you one. Hi, Hi, Senator. How are you? Uh, I'm well. How are you? Good. Hot. <laughs> uh, my name is Angie Monk, um, and I work for the Emmaus Community of Pittsburgh over in Pittsburgh, and we provide home and community-based services. Thank you. Um, so this is going to a question that will touch on the topic that you brought up, the better care, better jobs. 
Um, so, Senator Casey. Angie, thanks for mentioning the name of the bill. I appreciate that. No problem. <laughs> Uh, so there is a chronic direct support professional staffing crisis as it relates to providing home and community-based services. Direct support professionals serve some of the most vulnerable Pennsylvanians. I cannot express the importance of this work nor fully capture the complexity of the work in this one question. What is completely glaring to me is that the starting wages for somebody that performs this work is usually around $12 an hour. $12 an hour to care for some of the most intimate and critical needs of a human being, a person that is loved dearly by another person, a person whose life has value. We have to treat the people that care for them like they have value as well, and that means paying them more than a living wage. How do you propose to make statewide changes and reimbursement to providers in order to provide the appropriate wages to DSPs? Thank you. Angie, thank you. That's good. Like a lot of things tonight, that deserves a, a, a horn or, or an applause. Angie, thanks. I, I wish I could just, and I will, because I, I know we can get a copy of what you just um, outlined there in your question. That statement should be read by every single United States senator. So you've read it to me, so I'm, you're, you only got 99 more to go. But, Thank you. But we'll, we're going to make sure that these kinds of statements, these kinds of arguments are made, because it's not good enough for me to introduce a bill that would finally make the investment in home and community-based services that the, the challenge warrants, uh, we got to get it done. The way we get it done is by basically the second half of what we've been calling infrastructure for the last couple of months. I know there's a physical infrastructure only proposal the President's worked with Republican senators on. That's fine. That's good. It's good he's doing that. It's good they're doing that. That'll be roads and bridges and water systems, and so many other parts of our physical infrastructure. But we cannot go home, so to speak, meaning be done with these issues, and we're probably talking about between now and September getting all of it done. We cannot stop working on these issues until we pass this uh, home and community-based services initiative. Because there's four groups of Americans, and these, these four groups add up to tens of millions, not just millions, tens of millions of Americans. First, seniors who want care in the home. Doesn't mean they can't have care in a nursing home or in a long-term care facility if they want that. But if they choose to have care in the home, we should make sure that they have that option. And they don't right now because they're on a, they're more, almost a million people on a waiting list waiting for this care, a lot of them seniors. People with disabilities are the second group of Americans. They're waiting for these services on those waiting lists. And some of them have been on that waiting list for years, not just months. Third group of Americans we're trying to lift up are the ones that Angie made reference to, the workers. Twelve bucks an hour is not good enough for America to be the best country in the world for caregiving. We don't want to be second place or fifth place. We want to be the best. And you can't pay people to do, to do that essential, heroic work, and especially in the middle of a pandemic. These home care workers going into homes to provide services and help to seniors and people with disabilities and risking contracting the virus, putting themselves at risk, they went into those homes and provided that care. These folks need a raise. They need to be treated like the professionals that they are. If we say we care about old folks, older Americans, and we care about people with disabilities, we will invest in the workforce that takes care of seniors and people with disabilities. And that's who we're talking about and 12 bucks doesn't cut it. No benefits doesn't cut it. These workers should have a chance to join a union. That's what they should have a chance to do, so that we invest in them. So one way or another, we're going to get this done. One way or another, we're going to get this done, because this is a great American idea to take care of those who are vulnerable, to take care of those who have given us so much. It's not good enough to pat a guy in the back and say, you did a great job in World War II for your nation. But then he says, well, I want to have home care so I can be close to my family and close to the community. And we say, well, sorry, that we can't pay for anything that would reduce the waiting list. And I'm not talking about millions of dollars here. I'm talking about hundreds of billions we should invest and grow the Medicaid program to help these folks. And if there's some people in Washington that don't like that, 
I, I got news for them. We're going to get this done one way or the other. So get used to it, Washington. We're going to help people get home and community-based services. Angie just brought a breeze over here, so I've got a breeze. That's good. Good evening, Senator. Mark Rafel. Hey, Mark. Uh, how are you today? Good. I just saw you about a half hour yep. ago. Nice picture we got together. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and I understand the hair thing, so we're good there. Well, you got some... You no, got some... I'm, I, I fake it really well, too. <laughs> so my question is, yeah. as the county's new economic development coordinator, which yesterday was my first day, Wow. what is and how can the federal government help the rural counties and rural communities with economic development, economic growth in these times, especially since, as you heard from Muriel, with the problems we had with COVID of shutting a lot of our businesses down and bringing in employees. Mark, thanks so much. I appreciate you doing that work. I, look, I think there are a lot of things we can do and should do. Uh, there's no question that when it comes to basic uh, physical infrastructure, there's an opportunity there. When we pass these huge sweeping bills that, that focus on kind of the physical infrastructure needs of communities, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to be thinking about counties like Fayette County. We've got, for example, if you look at it statewide, I haven't looked at the Fayette County number recently, but statewide, we got more than 3,300 bridges that need work. That's just one example. You, you add up the, no, the dollars that we need for uh, water and sewer and stormwater and so many other basic infrastructure in a community, uh, we've, that's why we've got to get these big bills done. So that's one thing we can do is help on infrastructure because it's not only an investment in the community to keep people safe, uh, and to have, have services provided, but it's also a great job creator. And you know the, the numbers better than I do about an investment in infrastructure yielding a certain number of jobs. So that's one big thing we can do, and that's right in front of us. That's July, August, September maybe. I hope not beyond that. I hope we can get it done in the next three months. Uh, secondly, we've got to make sure that we're investing in strategies to keep the workforce, the skilled workforce that you have in Fayette County to keep them here. Now, I would argue it goes all the way back to my five freedoms for kids. In other words, if you invest in kids early on in Fayette County and you're, you're helping kids with early learning and, and good quality, affordable child care, if you're investing in kids, at least in the five ways I talk about it, they're more likely to be su successful in school and therefore the skilled work of the, that uh, the Fayette County economy is going to need down the road. So there's a lot there in terms of investments in kids, investments in workforce and training. We're trying to update some of that in the, uh, the Health Education Labor Pensions Committee we have. And I think also we've got to make sure that, that we're, we're thinking about the unique needs of small towns and rural areas. I represent a state that a lot of people in Washington think is a couple big cities and that's about it, right? They don't know that we have 67 counties maybe, they might know that but we have 48 counties that are considered rural. So when I talk about rural, I'm not just talking about agriculture and farming. We're talking about rural, meaning small towns, that need that investment, that need some of those off-system bridges to be repaired, that needs help with their, 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 both their physical infrastructure as well as the workforce and the caregiving infrastructure. So a lot we can do. Finally, last thing I'll say is directed spending from uh, the appropriation bills is coming back after not being there for a decade, or a little more than a decade. We want to make sure that we invest in local uh, priority projects throughout the state. So that's something else that we're going to be working on together. Finally, I'll say one of the best things to do in a county is to take guidance from and direction from what your local elected officials want to do, whether it's uh, your, your commissioners here in Fayette County or whether it's Muriel in the chamber and others, uh, to give us guidance on what you need. Thanks. <laughs> She's got a hat. <laughs> wow. I haven't seen this. That's pretty cool. It's got an American flag on it. So I guess I get to wear this for a while, right? And then I have to give it back. Don't worry, I'm not sweating too much yet. I was thinking <laughs> about giving you mine. <laughs> I didn't earn that one, and I don't know if I've earned this one, but I'll try. I'm a uh, disabled Vietnam veteran. Thank you, sir, and for my, your service. My question is, it's been a while 
since I've had a raise as my uh, disability check. I was wondering what you could do to not only help me, but my brother veterans. Sir, do you, you. do you mind giving us your first name? John Cole. John, thank you. Really appreciate it. First of all, your service and, f and for taking the time to be here and be in the hot sun on a night like tonight. Don't mean nothing. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we had a saying in Vietnam, don't mean nothing. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, look, there's no question that we have to do, uh, there's always a lot more to do at the federal level uh, to invest in, in programs and strategies to lift up our vets. Uh, that means that n not just the amount of disabil the disability pay, but also making sure we're doing everything possible to move those uh, disability, um, disability petitions through the process faster, the claims, I should say. The claims processing uh, for a lot of years has, has slowed, slowed down. We've cut that back a lot over the last, oh, more than five years now, but we still have work to do to get that number down. So you're not waiting. Uh, in some cases, it wasn't too long ago, about 10 years ago, when folks were waiting more than a year for that disability claim to be processed. So the speed at which those claims are processed, as well as the amount of the, uh, uh, the check you're getting. And I hope we can, we can put you in touch with both Robbie and Liz was here, and I know some others who are with us tonight, to talk about ways we can, we can provide some help, either directly uh, through our constituent services office or just to see if there are other ways we can help uh, on the disability issue. But we, the one thing that I will say that in that, re that rescue plan, there was a healthy, healthy investment in uh, VA health care. So veterans health care was a, a major priority in the, the rescue plan. But we lost too many veterans in COVID. The last, the last count I saw was more than 10,000, even maybe even closer to 11,000, but over 10,000 veterans lost to COVID-19. And we have to learn uh, important lessons from that experience over the last two years. Thank you, and God bless your service. Thank you, Senator. It's been an honor. Thank you. Senator, let me step in yes. for a minute and do just a little time check, and why don't I'll you get, some get, a, get some water? <laughs> <laughs> I need to announce that we have about uh, 20 minutes or so, so we can still take some questions. Uh, just wanted to make sure that we uh, knew where we were in the process. The questions are all excellent. It's so good to see so many people asking such thoughtful questions of the senator today. Get a good drink. Okay. Grab back. that hat. Oh, I forgot the hat. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you for coming to Fayette County, Senator Casey. Thank you. My name is Cole Leathers, and I'm from Greene County. And hey, Cole. Greene County, like a lot of southwestern Pennsylvania, has been supported by manufacturing and energy. So with a turn away from um, resource extraction, re excuse me, resource extraction right. towards renewable resources, what federal legislation do you propose to make sure that people in those communities aren't left behind? Yep. Cole, thank you. And I, we always welcome in Fayette County people from Greene County, right? <laughs> Where's Pam Snyder? She would she'd be glad I said that. Um, no, but it's a great question because look, we are we're in the process now, as a nation, uh, of having a debate about and and really I I believe we're going to make progress on dealing with a couple of big challenges all at the same time. Some of it, a lot of it, I think through the the infrastructure initiatives, either two bills or or maybe more than two, but probably more likely two. Uh, one that does physical infrastructure, but one that has to do a number of other things that they didn't get to, um, to all pointed in the direction of making sure that we have the, the best um, energy portfolio possible for what's ahead of us, as well as dealing with the, the very real and urgent threat of climate change. But part of the, that, that, so there are challenges, energy and climate change, all of that is obviously challenging, everyone knows why. But we also have to make sure that while we're doing that, not after and not as kind of a, an afterthought, we have to make it part and parcel of any climate bill, any energy bill, frankly, any infrastructure bill, in my judgment, is to make sure that we're helping the, the workers uh, and their families. And not some, some limited support and say, here's a, here's a check and you can you know, recover with that. I mean substantial help. Uh, whether it's wage replacement, everyone says, oh my goodness, that's expensive. Yeah, it is, but they deserve it. 
that means making sure that we might want to support not just the a retiring uh, coal miner, but maybe the next generation, his or her children. People say, oh, that's expensive. Yeah, it is, but we want to help them. We got to do that. That's what America is supposed to be about. They have given us so much by their work, by their labor. They kept their promise to their employer to do a good job. Many of them, I've said this over and over again, you know, we were fighting years ago. We couldn't get uh, health, uh, health care for re re retired uh, members of the United Mine Workers. It was held up and held up and held up in Washington. And I said, my God, if we can't keep this promise that was made by the federal government about 70 years ago, then we're not the country we say we are if we didn't keep that promise. These coal miners kept their promise to their employer, kept their promise to their family to work hard every day, sometimes for decades at a time. My grandfather spent five years in the mines when he was a kid, but no other member of my family has had been in a coal mine since. So we've had a pretty good deal. But that's not true of a lot of families. They've had to stay in those mines for generation after generation. A lot of those miners kept their, their promise to their country. They fought in Vietnam. They fought in, in other wars as well. So I just, I, I just want you to know the scale of this. I saw a proposal. There are a lot of legislative proposals. But I saw a proposal by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. They put together a, a paper on this, maybe, maybe 15 pages worth, with a lot of detail. And at the very beginning of it, they kind of gave an estimate of what this kind of, a, this kind of support for workers who are affected by the change in our economy, what would that mean? And they're focused mostly on those who did coal mining. They, they proposed something on the order of, and they had a range, 33 billion up to 83 billion, and depending on how many years, over 15 years or over 20 or 25 years. They're the kind of proposals I think we got to think about. Something of that scale, not a couple million or tens of millions or tens, you know, tens of billions. We, we need to have something substantial that helps those workers as we all move into the future together. And I think we can get that done. I think there's a lot of support uh, you know, on both sides of the aisle where we often don't agree on much to help those workers. Thank you, Cole. It is Cole, right? Yes, okay. Good evening, Senator. How you doing? Good evening. Um, so I have a, a three parts to my question. Uh -huh. So I'm happy that you spoke on early childhood education. Um, my first question is, how does universal pre-K impact Head Start programs? And I'm sorry, I'm Erica Thomas. Hey, Erica. I'm the director from Head Start of um, Head Start Early Head Start of Fayette County Private Industry Council. Thanks so much. Well, you're going to heaven then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, look, we, we, we've got to do all of it, in my judgment. Um, in my Five Freedoms for, for America's Children plan, I talk about a specific uh, allocation, a specific appropriation amount for uh, Head Start. Mm -hmm. Head Start uh, is very, has been for 50 years very, very successful, mm -hmm. but it's been underfunded. Don't even get me started on early Head Start, because <laughs> we got a small fraction of kids who are eligible, mm -hmm. eligible for Head Start, or, or let me start with early Head Start, eligible for early Head Start and are not enrolled, because mm -hmm. it's not funded. Mm -hmm. So we need billions more for Head Start, no question about it. And by the way, when I'm talking about billions for this and tens of billions for that, people say, where are you going to get the money? There's plenty of money in the tax code. <laughs> if you have your values right, if you want to do what we've done the last 40 years, this is what's happened in Washington for 40 years. Just bear with me a little, a little uh, speech here. 40 years of the tax code being rigged for huge multinational corporations. That's the number one beneficiary. And number two. We could honk the horns all night on that. And number two, the tax code has been rigged for 40 years for very wealthy Americans. And we've never asked them, we've never asked them to help us with some of these challenges, like the investments we need to make in our kids. If we're going to outcompete China, we can't do it on the cheap. We've got to invest in our kids. If we're going to have the highest skilled workforce in the world, got to invest in our kids. If we're going to fight crime, got to invest in our kids. In fact, there's a group with that title. Fight crime, invest in kids. You could just substitute other priorities. Outcompete China, invest in kids. Have the best skilled workforce, invest in kids. So you get the, you get the drift. I don't want to keep going. But, but so we, we've got to do both. We have to invest in Head Start, early Head Start. And I think we should pass 
as close as possible a legislative um, version of what President Biden talked about in his family's plan. He had a lot of good ideas in there. One of them was universal access to pre-K for all three and four-year-olds. Now, he didn't say most or try to or let's do our best. He said universal. Mm -hmm. And that's the great American way. We didn't say, you know what, we're going to go halfway to the moon and see if we can work it out. We said, no, we're going to the moon. John, John Fitzgerald Kennedy said that, and we did it. We didn't say we're going to try to win some battles in World War II. We said, no, we're going to win the war with our allies. Same, same kind of attitude we have to bring to bear on the lives of children. We got to invest in them and lift up them and their families. So thanks for what you're doing on Head Start and early care and learning. Thank you. So second part of my question is, due to the shortages of teachers in birth, early childhood, right. and in regular schooling, will there be any incentives for those that are going to enroll in education majors? Yeah, there, there'll be incentives because we want to make sure that we're, we're making uh, early, early care and learning more available, but also that we're investing in the workforce so that we can, we can lift up that workforce just like we're lifting up the, the long-term care or, or disability workforce. Correct. And then my last part is any updates in regard to the student debt total forgiveness? Student debt? Yes, sir. Not, a, not an update in terms of something having passed, um, but a, an update in this sense. I think that more members of Congress are hearing more about, a lot more about, student debt than we ever have before. And I think we should do some combination of the following. I'll just make a quick list. Number one is, why are you allowed to refinance your mortgage on your home, mm -hmm. but you can't refinance your student loan. That doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. There's no reason why someone who's borrowed money to get a higher education, mm -hmm. they're going to be paying money back. We know that. Yes, but they sir. should have a lower interest rate, and they ought to be able to get have an opportunity. Just to get it down even by, by a, a, a small amount would help a lot. Cutting that monthly payment mm -hmm. allows them maybe to put a, a down payment down for a house. It allows that young person right. to move in to the future with uh, some, some good foundation. Second thing we should do is, is to think about some degree of forgiveness. We still, have, we still haven't done the best job we could on loan forgiveness so that mm -hmm. someone goes into a, an underserved area and provides a year of, of volunteer work or some other, some other way of giving back. They ought, to, they ought to have some of their student loan forgiven for that. So mm -hmm. things like that. And then the overall number, I think we could probably, we're not there yet, we could probably get agreement on getting the number down uh, across the board, especially for uh, students uh, student borrowers who are lower income and middle income. Yeah. Now, if they're wealthy and they've got, you know, lots of people to help them pay their, their debts off, that's fine. But we, don't, mm -hmm. but we need to be helping folks in the middle and the lower end. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your support early childhood education. Thank you. Wow, this is a strong crowd. You're hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that none of those cars have air conditioning. That's why I'm really impressed by the people in the cars. <laughs> Good evening, sir. My name is Jana Kyle, and I'm from Fayette County Drug and Alcohol Commission. I am from the Single County Authority for Fayette. Oh, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Is your first name is Janet? Jana. Jana. Okay. Yes. Jana, thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the attention that you have brought with acts that included substance use disorder, that there is money available, and it has helped bring initiatives to the table. I'm going to ask for consideration, for future consideration, as the, our pandemic is on the other side mm -hmm. of what it is, that that funding doesn't stop. Yep. Because substance use disorder as a disease continues and has been there before the pandemic started. And I'm also going to ask for consideration that it's not the, any money that is available is not just for treatment, okay. it is also for prevention. As you had talked about early Head Start, Head Start, and investing in our children in prevention as we invest in our children, especially with evidence-based programs, the outcome will be the same as what you're looking for for education as well. Thank you. Well, Jana, thank you, and thanks for your work. Um, I want to commend everyone who does the kind of work you're doing, and uh, that's, that's worthy of more than one honk. You know, I think we learned a lot in the last uh, the last decade when, it, when we were wrestling with, in every community, small towns, big cities, suburban communities, places that never had these kinds of problems before all, all of a sudden had them. 
uh, and I'm talking about substance use disorder problems, which are the broad category. The opioid um, crisis was kind of a subset of that, but that's where a lot of it was being driven. And just the, the horror of the deaths and the destruction uh, that still persists. So number one is I think you're right. We can't just say, well, that it was only bad during the pandemic. We know it preceded that and will continue beyond. So we got to continue to make those investments in prevention and treatment. My father used to say years ago when he was going around the state with the, um, a, an anti-drug initiative at that time, he, he talked about good treatment works, right? Good treatment works. He said it over and over again, but that's true. Uh, we, ha we need folks to have access to good treatment because we know it works. And a good treatment's not a couple of days or a few weeks. You know better than I. So we got it. That's expensive, and we should, we should make investments in it. Secondly, I think we learned a lesson when we passed, uh, as part of the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion. What a lot of people don't realize is, in Pennsylvania, 1.1 million people got health care through the ACA. The lion's share of that, more than 800,000 at current numbers, of the 1.1 million people who got health care, they got their health care through what? Medicaid expansion. And they, a lot of people may know that, but they may not know the next part of the story, which is, of those 800,000 that got health care through Medicaid expansion, those with a substance use disorder problem uh, got treatment, coverage and therefore treatment, uh, that they never would have had for that substance use disorder issue they had. And this isn't a few thousand people. At one point, it was more than 70,000 Pennsylvanians got Medicaid expansion and then therefore got treatment for a substance use disorder problem. So whatever the exact number is, tens of thousands of people were, were helped by the expansion of Medicaid. So we should learn a lesson from that, uh, that that kind of coverage and treatment is, is, uh, totally, is totally essential and totally doable. That's probably the best way to say it. We can continue to help people with that kind of treatment if we make the right investments. Thank you, Jan. appreciate it. Okay, we have about uh, 15 minutes from here, and I suspect that's uh, two or two questions or so. I okay. know that we have some really good questions. Senator, maybe you we can get three. Grab, uh, maybe get three in there. That's a good I idea. I talk fast. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name's Chris Ryder, and I'm a certified nursing assistant. Your first assistant. name is? Chris. Chris, I'm sorry. And I'm a certified nursing assistant at Uniontown Healthcare and Rehab. I've been there for about 23 years. Wow, you have a hard job. Uh, Pennsylvania nursing homes are facing a staffing crisis Thanks. that puts safety and well-being of our residents and workers at risk. Experienced caregivers like myself are leaving the bedside because of low pay and poor conditions. We show up, up every day and day out to watch our residents suffer when there isn't enough staff to see that everyone gets care that they need. Our workers are mentally and physically exhausted and our residents are suffering. So Mr. Casey, will you fight for nursing home workers and residents by investing more resources into nursing homes and holding nursing homes companies accountable to safe staffing levels and better pay that attracts and retains dedicated workers. Chris, thank you. Is it short for Christine? Yeah. Which do you prefer? Either one. Okay. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Thanks for the work. Um, I, I think the, the, those who are doing caregiving in any economy in any, at any time are obviously doing uh, essential heroic work, but ever more so when you're doing it kind of uh, running uphill when, you're, when you, you're not the subject of, a, of enough, enough investment, where you have uh, uh, a high number of, of residents to take care of all at one time, you don't have enough staffing to help you as a, as a fellow staff member, in this case, a certified nurse's assistant. Um, so w my job at the federal level is to do a couple of things. Number one is there are ways at the federal level to hold nursing homes and other long-term care facilities accountable. One way to do it is to take, and I actually have a bill with Senator Toomey, you know, I'm a Democrat, he's a Republican, we're usually on different pages on a lot of issues, but on this issue we're on the same page. We want to take an existing program uh, in the federal government which keeps a, a list of the, the poor performing uh, nursing homes in the country, nationwide. The only trouble is the funding has been limited over the years and the attention to this program hasn't been uh, robust enough so that you only get, even though the list is maybe 500 facilities, it's roughly 3% at any one time of all the nursing homes in the country. So those 3% have real problems, and we've got to focus on them. 
It's called the Special Focus Facility Program. It's a good program, but we were only hearing about, depending on what year it was, only a, a limited amount. So if, if there's roughly 500 nursing homes on the list, we were only hearing about, or the, the public list was only about 80, maybe 80 to 100 at the most. So we want to make sure that all 500, roughly, depending on the year, that all 500 uh, are, are, uh, are the subject of public disclosure. So families are aware of what homes are having the trouble. So that's one thing we can do, and that's bipartisan legislation. But I think we've got to do more than that. I'm in favor of, and I've advocated for a long time, for uh, higher, better staffing ratios, investments in, in the workforce. And again, I, this is my bias, but I think a lot of Americans agree, agree with me. If someone has a union, they're more likely to have better, better pay and better benefits and over time can provide better care. I keep hearing about, I've heard this in a lot of long-term care facilities, that, that, um, that person who's doing the work that you're doing every day and gets trained and stays there for a period of time, all of a sudden there's a job down the street that pays more uh, at, at maybe some retailer and they're gone. And there's another, another vacancy, another, per, another position they have to fill and they've got to train that person and right. introduce them to all the residents. So we got to invest in the workforce in the ways that I just talked about with um, similar to what I talked about with home and community-based services to get the wages up and the investment in the worker. But we also have to make sure that, that nursing homes are held accountable. And look, I'm the first one to say we're going to hold you accountable, but we also have to help nursing homes when they are under-resourced. Chris, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Senator. How are you? How are you? I'm A.J. Barney. I'm a, Perry Town I'm a supervisor in Perry Township, Perry County. And I'm also privileged enough to be the... A.J., you got some fans out there. <laughs> yeah. but this is North Union Township. Beautiful area. But anyhow, um, I'm also the chairman of the Pennsylvania State Association of Township Supervisors. So, as you know, it's over 1,400 townships. Yeah. And with the American, with the American Recovery Plan... We're looking for you, if, if it's possible, if, if you could include the bridge, the bridges and infrastructure plan, because yes. that would really help us with unfunded mandates for our, you know, for our roads and our bridges to be able to use some of that money that way. So you could thank you. AJ, I appreciate it. Are you in particular? Are you talking about off-system bridges a lot too, or well, mostly yeah. Yeah, our, our local bridges. Yeah, right. You know, that's what it comes down, and even our paving. You know, that money, like you you referred to North Union getting over a million dollars. Yeah, we can't buy in blacktop with that. Right. One of them deals. Okay. No, I appreciate that, and you're, you're right to focus on this because in our state, in your community and a lot of others, you've got bridges <clears throat> that may not be in a, on the big PennDOT list, but they still need help. Exactly. Um, and we've got, I don't know the exact number currently, but it's, uh, we've got, in any one county sometimes, you can have uh, hundreds of those bridges. What, what we did a couple years ago, I worked with Roy Blunt. He's a senator from Missouri. He's a Republican. We worked together to get the allocation number higher for off-system bridges for funding. That one change alone, just by moving the percentage up, um, allowed Pennsylvania to get about $70 million more a year. I think it was like $69 million. We, but that ran out, that, that, that provision of the law. We need to, to um, reinstitute that provision. We're trying to do that uh, as part of this infrastructure initiative right now. So if we get a vote as I think we will in the next few weeks, or at least the next two months, on a physical infrastructure bill, that's the time to try to get that done. So we're working tr to try to, to get it done. So, you're, so you'll have more resources at a local level to fix those, those bridges in small towns. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Appreciate your work. Hi, Senator Casey. How are you? My name's Jerry Onessi. Uh, I'm a member of the Fayette uh, New Deal Democrats. I want to welcome you here. Thanks, Jerry. Um, my question for you is, do you feel it's necessary to abolish the Senate filibuster in order to promote the, the agenda that the American people have obviously voted for? Yeah, I, I've been in favor of, of changing what I call, some people call it filibuster, which is kind of a confusing word because it has like four definitions, but the 60 vote rule, meaning that you need 60 votes in the Senate, and a lot of people forget about this, sometimes you need 60 votes just to proceed to the debate, and then you need 60 votes to get out of the debate, and then another 60 to pass a bill. That doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, maybe it did at one point. I used to think that maybe it brought about 
uh, more consensus. Uh, that obviously hasn't happened much in the last 10 years. You, when you know you can count major initiatives maybe on one or two hands uh, that the United States Senate has come together on, if you, if you, if you exclude COVID bills where everyone was on the same page, other than those, we haven't had a lot of consensus. So I think a legislative body like the U.S. Senate can still be a great deliberative body, a great debating body when we're at our best, could, could pass measures the American people want us to pass with 51 votes. I don't think that's a radical idea. It's called, called democracy. And look, that's people say, oh, that's a change for you. You used to not believe that. Yeah, that's true. It is a change. But when you have basic protections for voting rights, for example, that will be not just thwarted in the next couple of days, weeks, or months, but completely blocked and obstructed over many years, as is likely to happen, um, we, we can't allow a rule. There's nothing in the Constitution about 60 votes. There's no statute that says that. It's just a rule in the U.S. Senate, which we can change with 51 votes. Now, now some on the Republican side are complaining. Mitch McConnell, for example, the former, the now minority leader in the Senate, used to be the Republican majority leader, he changed the vote, the, the 60 vote rule down to 51, for Supreme Court justices. Yes. Someone who gets a lifetime appointment, they could be on that court for 40 years, even 50 years if they're young enough. And that, that's a 51 vote deal? And, and a voting rights bill has to, has to pass with 60 votes? That doesn't make any sense anymore. So look, I don't know if we're going to have the votes to change it to 51 for every matter, but we at least have to push members of my party, because it's about us right now, to vote in favor of a rule change at a minimum to allow voting rights to get a, a vote. Just vote on the floor. If you don't want to vote against it, fine. But let's get a vote and see who has 51 votes, uh, as well as some major other initiatives that we have. I could, I could make a longer list, but I won't for tonight. But thanks for raising the question. It's a critically important question about how we achieve progress. Thank you. This is a patient, durable crowd. We are indeed. <laughs> Senator, good afternoon. I'm Leslie Grenfell. I'm the executive director of Southwestern Pennsylvania Agency on Aging. So oh, it's, Leslie, thanks for your work. You're, you're very welcome, Senator, and thank you for yours. Um, already today, we've heard about the crisis with the di uh, direct care workers. Thank you. We've also heard about the need to reinvest um, in nursing homes, mm -hmm. in nursing home care, and hold them accountable. Um, I'm here on behalf of the seniors in, in Fayette County and Washington and Greene County to ask for your support for increases in the need for home delivered and congregate meal services. What we're seeing is um, large numbers of people in need right. of um, food insufficiencies. And um, we're hopeful that the Older Americans Act will provide additional funding to, to support the high need in the communities that we serve. Thanks Thank so you. much. And you, you have my support, but that's the easy part to say is support it. Uh, the hard part is making sure that we keep this in front of the Senate so that we're providing more help for uh, nutrition assistance, food assistance for, for seniors. Look, this, this hunger and food, what, you know, Washington's been using this phrase food insecurity which isn't a great way to explain it because it's it's hunger we're talking about uh, this hunger problem we've had uh, is it's been been a challenge these last couple of years but especially during COVID I mean the numbers are just astronomical millions more in terms of an increase right um, so at one point it was hovering around 50 million Americans hungry that makes no sense with the resources we have and the, and the resources of the government. So food assistance was a, a failed mission for most of, almost all of 2020. Until we got to the December COVID bill, we finally got some help there, but it shouldn't have taken from, even the CARES Act didn't do enough. From the CARES Act in March of 20 to the, the, the second to last COVID bill, you know, the one before the rescue plan um, in December. So you're right, we've got to make sure that we're focused on these investments making sure that we have the dollars for these, frankly, r really effective programs that deliver meals to, to seniors, and whether it's congregate meals or food assistance generally. So I'm in, favor of, I'm in favor of making sure that we keep enough funding for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. All these, these anti-hunger and, and feeding programs, we gotta, we gotta support. And by the way, it, 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 one of the great 
partners in this has been American Agriculture. They've helped us enormously here in Pennsylvania and all around the country. So thanks for raising it. So, Senator, I think we're at our last question here for tonight. And it's a pirate fan. He is a, <laughs> he is he is. a good man. They're a little below 500, but we're... A little, yeah. You know, a kid from Lackawanna County, Max Cranick, uh -huh. pitched five innings and sent 15 batters to the dugout. Right. And his reward for that is they sent him back to the minors the next day, but I think they had to by the rules. Right. Yeah. But I want to lift up a Lackawanna County guy who pitched for the Pirates and did Very a great good. job for Thank five you. innings. Uh, Sean Seipel, I'm uh, uh, with the Private Industry Council. I'm going to talk about workforce development, I guess. Um, you know, we hear a lot of talk here recently about infrastructure in America, and, and, and while it's true with roads, bridges, and everything else, yeah. and we have, uh, you know, it, when you think about infrastructure, you think about barriers that have to maybe be removed to, uh, to put a highway in. And, and I guess in my context, uh, I look at our workforce development model or our, uh, our people, you know, youth, uh, adults, whatever, um, in terms of our real infrastructure in this country. And then how do we, or how, how can the federal government, I guess, help in organizing and understanding and finding out the, the, the barriers that are in the way of not just them, but in, in promoting growth uh, in rural America uh, itself? And how do, we, how do we put our folks in the best uh, position possible to succeed? So. Mostly about the workforce. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, Sean, thank you, and thanks for doing that work. It's, um, it's critically important to focus on this because it's not going to be enough to have the dollars for a project, whether it's a water project or sewer or, or bridge or all kinds of other projects. You got to have the um, you got to have the workers to do the work. One thing that we've done over, if you look at over the last 25 years in the federal government, you had the Workforce Investment Act in the 90s. I think it was 98. I can't remember exactly, but and then you had updates of that. The most recent update was in 2015 so-called WIOA, the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, I think it was called, yep. where we made some good improvements. They consolidated some programs, made it more efficient. But the, the goal has always been, and I, I can't say that I can certify that we've got an A-plus rating on this in terms of what the federal government does, but we're, the goal has to be for the federal government is to set up as best you can the systems and the mechanisms for local employers, local chambers, obviously, the, the training community, uh, the workforce, um, the folks who are involved in workforce, workforce investment boards, community colleges, other institutions of higher education, and of course employers themselves, either individually or represented by the chamber, um, to be at the same table to design a workforce strategy for that community. And obviously in some communities, they may not be fully prepared if there is a big infusion of of infrastructure dollars. They may not have the workforce. So we've got to work with them to, to prepare that workforce. Um, now, I think when you talk about the skill level or the, the skill development part of workforce development, I think I go back again. I know it's like a broken record, but I go back again to uh, the Five Freedoms for America's Children because we're going to have the best skilled workforce in Fayette County or in Lackawanna County or anywhere in the state if we invest in early care and learning, if kids get off to a healthy, smart start in life, and they're protected from people who do them harm, and we, 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 we don't allow them to go hungry. If we're investing in those kids, they're going to have the high skill level to outcompete anybody in the world. But Sean, thanks for yeah, that thank work. You. It couldn't be more important today. So Muro, Those, should I wrap it up? You should indeed. Do I wrap or do you wrap? You wrap, actually. I wrap, okay. So have You can it. have the floor again if you want it. But Muro, thank you for doing this. Let's. I didn't ask for uh, uh, applause and horns yet for Muro, except very quickly at the beginning. So oh, let's hear it for her. Not necessary. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Muriel, you are now a professional MC, so you can do this anywhere in the country. You got cer <laughs> you're certified now. I'm certified now. All <laughs> no, right. But I do want to thank everyone for being here. This is a. This is a. Um, uh, a civic engagement. So you're here because you love your country, you love our Commonwealth, and you love Fayette County. And you wouldn't be sitting here in the sun <laughs> if you didn't love all three, right? And I'm so grateful that you're here with us. Those who ask questions, let's hear the horns for those who ask those questions. And I just want to wish you a great rest of the week. Have a happy Fourth of July. And I look forward to coming back to Fayette County. Maybe the next time I can come back with, to Fayette County when we have one of those big checks we can hand out. Sounds or at good least, to me. <laughs> at least be standing next to a check. Because we want to invest in Fayette County. God bless you and thank you.
Thank you, Senator. All right, there it is.